Although it may have the reputation of being the cat game, Stray combines a fascinating and visually stunning world with satisfying platforming. Don't, don't get me wrong. Being a cat is charming as hell. Sleeping, scratching at furniture, rubbing against robot shins. It's, you might say, perfect. P-perf... <sighs> what the fuck? fuck is my life. All these lol, look what the cat did bits are contrasted by these sad and melancholy moments throughout the story. One of these moments that sticks in my mind is when Cat is in the control room overlooking the city in the bunker and you realise that this massive journey back to Cat's family, that a human could have realistically walked the width of the city in about a day. Do not skip on Stray. It is a charming and oddly touching platformer that does not overstay its welcome. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge is an injection of pure 90s nostalgia directly into my veins and I am all for it. From its art style to its level design, this was made for the generation that grew up watching the Turtles. But they weren't afraid to add modern touches, such as super attacks and a wider variety of enemies, meaning you have to change your style of play. <laughs> and the, the soundtrack. The soundtrack has absolutely no excuse to go as hard as it does. Listen to this. Shredder's Revenge is number four on my list due to its very short playtime. A few hours at most. But as I have said before, when your only critique is that you want more of something, that is not a bad thing at all. Never would I have thought that a Marvel XCOM deck building game would actually work. But here we are, Marvel Midnight Suns is my number three. The fluid strategic gameplay is the highlight of the game, with you trying to visualise the most efficient and quickest way to complete your various objectives. And if you can do that in a single turn, it is so satisfying. Overall, the story feels like an MCU film. Lots of quips, lots of saving the world. But I do like how the Avengers and the Midnight Suns don't really get along, and there is this constant theme throughout the game of technology versus magic. But oh my god, the game is too long. I streamlined it, and it still took me like 40 hours to complete. And, and, even with a relationship mechanic, you cannot romance any of the Marvel heroes. I just want a game where I can pork Spider-Man. Is that too much they to ask for? Maybe this game doesn't deserve to be on my list. No, it does, it does, it does, it does. A visual novel lives and dies by its writing. Let's just clear that up right away. Digimon Survive is a visual novel. Yes, it does have some very good turn-based strategic combat, but about 70% of this game is visual novel. But it leans into something that the anime never did, and that is a bunch of teenagers thrown into the wilderness with monsters, no food, no water. Yeah, they're in real danger. And it is really cool to see how the different characters react to this situation. I thrives being put into the position of a leader. Ryo is driven mad by the situation. And Shuji becomes a complete asshole. Fuck Shuji. And oh my god, these writers have no qualms about killing off a bunch of teenagers if they deem it necessary. As someone who grew up watching the animes, you do get a bit fed up hearing the same conversations happen in every Digimon game. Like, Oh my god, it's Ducky Monster, what are you? Uh, 
it's a Digimon. Why does this place look so weird? Like it's a bunch of different places smashed together. It, it's the digital world. What? Agumon, you've changed. What's going on? You've gotten bigger. It's called, Di uh, it's Digivolution. Please stop. This game scratched and clawed its way through developmental hell and just for that reason alone it has more than earned the number two spot on my game of the year list. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And man, they took that to heart when they made God of War Ragnarok. The developers only really had to fine tune the minor issues from the previous game. And they did that with more enemy variety, better pacing. You know, every time you go to a new level, you're guaranteed plot progression, character development, and or world building. That's good writing. What else is good writing is seeing the development of all various characters throughout the Ragnarok game. Kratos is softer, Atreus is tougher, Freya more forgiving, and Sindri... Dude, Sindri is just a different dwarf by the end of this game. It's also really cool seeing Atreus become a fully playable character, and that opens up so many more possibilities for the franchise going forward. We could maybe see a DLC or spin-off game for Atreus, similar to what they did with Miles Morales and the Spider-Man game. Does he become the new protag going forward and maybe finally put Kratos to rest? I just don't know. There is there is so much more I want to discuss, but due to time restrictions of this Game of the Year episode, I can't, so I will just leave it with this. God of War series has been a flagship of the PlayStation now for 17 years. That's 15 games across four generations of consoles, and Kratos taking down two pantheons of gods, yet God of War Ragnarok stands the top of all of them as the best. And that is why it is my game of the year.